got Branch wide open. And Cliff Branch is to the 15-yard line. First down, Raiders. He not only can run, can catch the ball, but can throw it. Play pass. Blanchett going for six. Dumps it out to Marcus Allen at the 10. The 5. Touchdown, Raiders. That I grew up on, then I grew up on. I'm funny now, I have for home. <laughs> Worst twisted, but you're sober. Uh, never... Can't win football games like that. Go, so, Jim Plunkett. 2 12, left and a half. Going for Marcus Allen for a touchdown. Third and five out of the I formation. The pitch to Marcus Allen. He's a cross midfield running the hook at the move he put on. Dodd Cooper beat the goal. This is veteran upper-class leadership, and there's Javier Duran again stepping into the passing lane, rising up. There's a back out a little off the mark for Duran. Duran trying to no-look pass to Downey. That's taken away, and Sanders has his dunk blocked by Duran on the other end. Duran puts it up. It's good. Bob Chandler in motion to the near side. That is Marcus Allen. Duran, nice pass down low for Townsend. You see what's at stake here when these guys start acting like that. Hard to the rim, has it rejected it back. Teachers, directors, skilled architectures, do what they do, the room they're connected to. With the guards, you choose the best they're Who was the one you think they reflect? Allen gets the call. Oh, and more. Marcus Allen has just won it for the Raiders. They'll have it. So the former high school quarterback uh, completed two passes. I know, maybe they should have played him quarterback. <laughs> Somebody's head. Kansas City out eight penalties for what? 60 yards? 65 yards. That's a costly penalty. Here's Marcus throw. Allen going to throw again in the end zone. Touchdown! Dolphy Williams, a rookie from UCLA. 19 first downs for the Raiders. 16 for Kansas City. Oh, gee, what a hole. He's in there. Fumble. Loose football, but a touchdown. Receivers left and right. Barnwell to the right side, Branch to the left. They need 10, the Raiders do. Touchdown. Duran picks it up, and Hobby trying to push the pace. Takes it himself and lays it in. Two point game. Comes off the screen as Duran. Double. Almost lost it. Recovered crossover pull up. I was just going to say. Shut up, I've been into the stick 
came up with the killer, can I come and they cut him and hit him harder? Oh, kill him. Hold up a bit, he never think of a man. Allen, he's got a good arm. He used to be a high school quarterback. Todd Christensen, touchdown Raiders. Yeah, yeah, super shutout. In the third. <laughs> Second and in inches. Dickerson as well. Marcus Allen in the clear. 30, 20. Allen for a touchdown. This is second interception. The Raiders have the ball again. 20 nothing lead. Marcus Allen on his way. third quarter. Here's Marcus Allen. Putting back up field and Marcus Allen could be gone. Seventy-four yards for Marcus Allen. And the Raiders are starting to shove this one in the winner's column. Seventy-four yards consideration early in his career of making Mike Haynes the wide receiver. It looks like it would have worked. Here is Marcus Allen. Allen cuts back again. Marcus Allen to the 30. Finally out of bounds at the 19-yard line by... Ford. He and Wills were fighting for not realizing the same team. Yell gets the ball. Crossover. Step back. Durin. Elbow jumper. He's... Everyone's in the pattern. And Plunkett has time. Looking for Allen. All right. Spectacular kick. Oh. Marcus Allen. Corner of the end zone. Beautifully thrown ball. Great protection for Plunkett. 30-yard time. Third and one. A pass on third and one. And they're going for it all. Marcus Allen. Down. Downs in out deep on the left against the 2-3 zone. McLaughlin and Starks at the top of it. Duran steps in her lane. Duran, a runner, makes it. Almost every time with great blockouts. Duran might have gotten away with an offensive foul. Duran off the feed from... Boy, they battling for position down there. Look at this one here. Durant. Durant has got to. Wilson. Going long for Allen. Marcus Allen at the 40-yard line. Did they touch him? No, they didn't get him. All the way to the five-yard line. Marcus Allen. Heisman Award. Third and ten now for Bucket. He can do so many things. Hey, he can. That's yeah. why Hawkins and Pruitt. No, it's Allen behind Wilson. Going for Marcus Allen. 25 20, and Marcus Allen has a touchdown. And the build up for this game was incredible. We've been leading in. This is the only graphic 15 13. Pretty close. They're going after it. His first basket of the game. Harris from long range. And Durin the rebound. It's more comfortable when he's in rhythm getting a good pass. Oh, Durin got the step scoring the foul. Yeah, he just, the whole world has changed. Everybody's a stranger. Durin's running around. And he's third down and 10. 
Look at his time. Goes deep. Marcus Allen is there. Marcus has it to the five. Marcus dives. Touchdown. First down from their 39-yard line. Hester in motion. And it's Marcus Allen. Change of direction. What a move. footing and the pass protectors have an advantage. Third down and three. The ball at the 46-yard line. Raiders in their own territory. It's Marcus Allen. 40. Good head fake makes it at the 30. To the 20 and then out of bounds. Kind of ball reaction earlier in the game. In fact, it was he that stopped the touchdown drive in the first quarter. Third and five. Allen, who else? Bang is the click and bang you. And I done seen too many teams chasing a dream in the bloodstream, contaminated and seen it. And I done seen it on words that he said and she said and he said. After drop Sasha, everybody cut. Less than two minutes to play. Three pointer in the air and Surin directing traffic against Chunama. Durin back up top. What a move on Chunama. Nice look in the lane. Townsend lays it in. and Allen, the setbacks for the Raiders. Marcus Allen heading for the end zone. He's going in. 24 yards and a touchdown as the Raiders come back quickly. Allen trying to stay atop the AFC Central, leading 14-3. Will send to Allen. Touchdown. And just as simple as that, the Raiders have another six. A few years. Denver's emerged. Under Danny Reeves, John Elway, and Kansas City is back again. Tough division out here. Second and ten. Good hole for Allen inside the 20. Marcus to the 10. To the 5. Huh? Touchdown, Marcus Allen. What a great effort. Steve Smith is in there at fullback. And Marcus Allen breaks it. Gilbert caught him from behind along with Vincey Glenn. Burline with time, wide open is Marcus Allen. Touchdown. He's carried 16 times for 52 yards. We're still in the first half. And here he is again. He's got it. Third down and less than one. Pitch the throw. Marcus is looking. Andrew Glover's the man. He's got it for a Raider touchdown. The rookie from Grambling in the end zone for the first time. And Raiders went with him with a wild card against the Chiefs, and he had a rough time. Four down and seven. And the Raiders have a first down. Marcus Allen hooking up with Gay Schrader. Oh, some beautiful moves. And Cash. Allen the deep back. Touch to Allen. What a great job. What a great job. Marcus Allen. What a great job. For the touchdown. What a exciting player. One of the more explosive receivers in the league. Touchdown. Marcus Allen. You got to be able to block the pass rush out and still execute. First and ten for the 30. Marcus Allen inside the 20. He's got one man to beat if he can turn the corner. Touchdown, Marcus Allen. Walker with lovely like Jennifer and son Nathaniel are here cheering him on today on third down and eight. First time he's had to scramble. Allen, touchdown, Marcus Allen, the veterans, Montana to Marcus. It's not a bad call right now. No timeout for Houston. They give to Allen. He's got the first down. He's got a touchdown. Everything, Mark. It's a second and nine at the 36-yard line. Texas A&M, who played well at Dallas. 
Second and ten. Draw to Allen. Finds a hole. 50. 45. 40. Chased by Lewis, and Albert Lewis gets him down at the 20-yard line. Marcus Allen with his longest run of the season. Saved the touchdown. First down at the 48 yard line. The swing from Bono. Marcus Allen. He breaks the tackle. Down to the 30. To the 20. Puts the speed on. And he was tripped up getting inside the five yard sure that you all have some knowledge now one of the uh, top leading the number one disease that's affecting you all is chlamydia does anybody know what chlamydia is brothers if you're a young man you got something inside the zipper and it can be poison or it can be potential i'm just being real so so when brothers act like they're gonna die you just be like, well, you know, if that's going to kill you, I'm going to go ahead and let you die because you're about to make history. You're about to make the Guinness Book of World Records. And somebody needs to be here to report it. To the, come on, talk to me, somebody. Talk Television, America's number one teen talk television show. I tell you, we are excited and ignited about a show today. It's going to be a historic show. I am your host and your producer, Pastor Willie D. Brown, broadcasting live at the Faith House Studios. And once again, everybody knows that ain't no talk like teen talk. All right. Well, everybody just kind of turn to the sideways and look, and look this way. Today we have an exciting show for you. We have some excellent guests. We have one young man that's going to come in. He's off the chain. And we have another Hall of Famer that's going to come in after him. But the first young man, let me introduce you to him. He grew up right across the river. He played for Oakville High School. He went from Oakville High School. Now, I don't know if you know about the Ivy League. The Ivy League are schools like Yale and Harvard. Those schools that you got to be real, real smart for them to even consider you. So he had to be academically able to go to the school, but he was also a superstar in high school. And I mean, he was handling his business. He's one of the most left, one of the most gifted left-handed soft par shooters you'll ever see. After that, he left and he went overseas. After he went to Yale, he graduated from Yale, went to play professional basketball for two years. And then he came back home and he got married and now he works for the St. Louis Baseball Cardinals. Team Talk, put your hands together and welcome Mr. Javier Duke. Welcome to Team Talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As I was saying, uh, this, this young man is a, a very a gifted young man. Matter of fact, uh, when I met him, it was on Teen Talk Television. He came to Teen Talk Television, and he had just went to Yale. And so when he came to the television show, uh, he came, and everybody was, you know, picking his brain about, you know, going to Yale, going to an Ivy League school. And there was more than that that happened on the show when he first came to the show. There was a young lady in the audience on Teen Talk Show. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he looked at her, he kind of knew that she was somebody special. So he came to the show. Now, at that time, y'all, she wasn't really feeling them. You know, she said, because, you know, he had the flat top and she thought it looked like kid and play and stuff. That's but he said. knew she didn't know no better. So after he graduated from Yale, he went overseas. He played ball for two years. It's about growing up. I mean, growing up, I mean, I mean, you pretty much, you know, 
Were you a normal kid? Were you an average kid? Did you dream about uh, going basketball hoop <laughs> and went to uh, Kansas University in Lawrence, their basketball camp? I got up there on a Sunday, and it was my dad, my mom, my grandmother. They drove me there. Mm -hmm. And so when we got there. On a staff. Uh -huh. you know, so how did you. How did you battle, but how did you handle it as a young third grader, keeping your head, not to get the big head and get swole, you know? Yeah, uh, definitely credit my mom, man. She some tournament, junior varsity tournament. I was a freshman and we won all three games. I had like 20 points, 10 assists each game. And so it was after that tournament, he was like, uh, Can't hold you uh, back. I think you're ready. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean, it, it really wasn't. Uh, you know, any any adjustment as far as being on the court. I, was, mm -hmm. I felt like I was prepared mm -hmm. to step in. So once I did, I got past that junior varsity tournament. I think it was a couple games later. Um, I was actually starting on varsity as a freshman. And I was 6'4 now, but as a freshman in high school, I was, I don't know, 5'8". What? Uh, yeah, I okay. was like 5'8", 5'9", uh, maybe 150. 50 pounds so hey, spinach or what? I don't, I don't know. Something <laughs> happened, man. I'm glad it did. Yep. <laughs> but I was real small, but I was talented, and I knew that yep. I was talented. So that was the biggest thing, was just me having the confidence to step in and play against, you know, the juniors and the seniors and the upperclassmen and, and, and let them know that, hey, I got as much right to be on this court as you do. But two things. First of all, I'm glad you grew because at 5'8 <laughs> or 5'9, uh, Heaven would not have given you the time of day. She no, don't like short nada, guys. Nada. So she, you can't have no Kirk Franklin man. in her life, hey, amen, unless he's friend. singing. What? <laughs> Just a friend. Friends, friends. <laughs> Thank you, y'all. Some good questions. Before y'all get some good questions, one thing I want to point out what really, you know, besides just being gifted and going to Yale, coming from St. Louis, what really uh, hit home with him was that when he came on the show and I asked him, you know, what's the number one thing in your life? He didn't say athletics, he didn't say sports, he didn't say fame, he didn't say all star teams. He said, my faith, my relationship with Christ. And that's what really blew me out the water. And I want to say that to you all because some of y'all right now, you're in school and, you know, um, you know, being down with the Lord and having a relationship with the Lord, it ain't cool. You know, it's, it feel like, you know, you got to be uh, something wrong with you. But I want to let y'all know, he said that on that show. And when he said that on the show, the young lady that he married is my goddaughter that I had since she was five. And so when he said that, I was saying, man, I hope that my goddaughter marries a guy like him. I didn't know it was him. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, I hope that, he, that she marries somebody uh, uh, like him. Now, when he went to college, most colleges you go, they got all the fraternities, you know, the omegas, the kappas, the alphas, the sigmas. They got all those fraternities, the Greek, Greek organization that you can go to. Well, when he gets to Yale, him and some other Christian brothers, like, where the Christian frat at? Why come in ain't no Christian fraternity? So, you know what they did? They went out and started one. There's a Christian fraternity at Yale now that him and seven other brothers went out and started. So don't think when you go to college, you just got to fit in. You just got to do what everybody else do. If you stand for something, then people will follow you. Dr. King said, you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And so I just want to say that to you all because I know that when you get in school and stuff, if you go around there talking about, what's the number one? You're on Channel 5 or Fox 2. What's the number one thing? You say, my faith. Man, you said your faith. Man, you're a punk. How you talking about your faith? You should have said the gals, man. You should have said the gals. No. I want to let y'all know he's an outstanding young man. He met an outstanding young woman, and now they have an outstanding young marriage, and both of them work for the St. Louis Cardinals. So if I ever need to borrow something, I know that they load it like that. <laughs> so ask some questions, y'all. Give me some questions. Who want to go first? Ask them a question about it. Oh, y'all all bummer. There you go, Keith. Was uh, Ivy League school always like in your dreams? Like some of you, that's somewhere where you wanted to go? Or you was just going with it? Uh, that's funny. I get that question a lot, man. Um, and another question similar I get is, you know, how do I get to an Ivy League school? How do I get to professional basketball? Honestly, growing up, I didn't know that I wanted to go to Ivy League school. Uh, I didn't even know, there was, there was a point in my time where I didn't know if I wanted to play basketball at the next level. But what I did do was that um, I always did well in school and I always worked at basketball the hardest that I could so I could have those particular opportunities. And so when the opportunity to go to Yale came, uh, I was like, of course, you know, why not? Um, it's kind of the best of both worlds. I get a chance to learn it at, you know, one of the top institutions. I also get to play basketball athletically uh, at the highest level, Division I level as well. And so it, it, it was kind of funny. I'm glad that I did go to Yale. Uh, you know, I 
told Pastor this the last time I was on the show. That probably wasn't my first choice. I wanted to wait to see what kind of other offers I was going to get. But uh, I talked to my mom about it, and she said, no, nah, you going to yeah. I don't care what everybody else <laughs> say. Like, you going. So, uh, But, yeah, I, I think it, it ended up working out. And the biggest thing for me was that I put myself in position to, to have those types of opportunities, right? And that's a great thing. Don't miss y'all what he keep on saying. He put himself into a position. The way you put yourself into position is your grades. Don't mess a whole lot of players. Y'all probably know them. They could have went to the NBA. They're standing on the corner right now. They had to give. They can shoot threes like nobody else, but they're on the corner. They're still back in the hood because I don't care how good you are athletically. Once you get to college in order to have the opportunity, then you got to be able to be prepared to go to the next level because the future is there for those who pre prepare for it. And I think wasn't it hard? After you, your mama had said, yeah, I went to another Ivy League school that was uh, Princeton. Princeton, yeah. Something uh, uh, that you're trying to do in life, but you also create the opportunity. That was firm in their belief, firm in their faith, firm in their ability. Hill, not Oak Hill, not Oak Hill. Myself in a position to have these different opportunities, right? I went on from Yale to play professional basketball overseas. And so during the summertime, when uh, a lot of my teammates, they would go home. They would go home and get internships. Well, I would stay at Yale and, and train. So I was on the, the weight program, and I had access to the gym all day. And so I got a job at the golf course. Uh, doing groundskeeping works. I was like cutting grass and doing that stuff. So I would work eight hours. I think the, the hours were like 5.30 to 2, get off at 2, go into the weight room, do, do whatever lift, and then I would have the rest of the evening to myself. And so I had a couple of friends. We would, you know, play and just get better. And I did that every single summer. Um, so I didn't even, I didn't do internships. I didn't do any of that stuff. Um, and again, man, just put myself in a position to play professional basketball um, if that was what I wanted to do. And then academically, man, it was just taking – um, advantage of the opportunity. Uh, he said it best. I mean, having a degree from Yale speaks volumes, man. And whenever you're in an opportunity and you have an opportunity, um, I wanted just to take advantage of it. And so the greatest thing about going to Ivy League school, man, wasn't, of course, it wasn't the academics. It wasn't the fact that I played basketball athletically, man. It was the network and it was the people, the people that I met, man. Um, even here, like the, the president of the Cardinals, Yale graduate. I mean, they're just so, so – the network of Ivy League is just so deep, man. And so the fact that you have it on your resume, it opens so many doors. All right. Well, we've truly – I've truly uh, been impressed with this young man. I don't, I don't just say that because he's my godson in love, but, but I, you know, to admire somebody from um, pretty much, like I say, as a freshman. And one thing about it, I've always had, uh, you know, incomparable respect for you. I mean, you've always walked in integrity, and you've always been a gentleman. And, uh, I mean, the fact that you kept, your, you kept things balanced, you, you kept your spiritual, uh, your, your physical, your academic, and your athletic. And when you balance all four of those layers in life, success is attached to that formula. So once again, uh, thank you all so much. Uh, he was the man. But he just, we, he just waited until he got his opportunity. Just make sure that you're in a position to excel. You're in a position to put yourself in a position to be all you can be. So once again, uh, uh, with Javier, I am, I am, I'm proud of you, man. And uh, I thank you that you, you give back. You know, a lot of athletes, man, it's all about them. I got mine. You get yours. But you've never been selfish. You, there's never been a time that I've asked you to come and speak whether it was here, we're a youth quake or anywhere, and I, and I know you, you inspire people. Take are y'all ready? Take it. I said, are you ready? Come on now, ain't no Trump like me. 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 Now, ain't no Trump like me. Ain't no Trump like me. Ain't no Trump like me. Somebody scream. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. America's number one team talk television show. And everybody knows that ain't no talk like team talk. Good evening and welcome to Teen Talk Television, America's number one Teen Talk Television show. I tell you, we are excited and ignited about a show today. It's going to be a historic show. I am your host and your producer, Pastor Willie D. Brown. 
broadcasting live at the Faith House Studios. And once again, everybody knows that ain't no talk like Teen Talk. Oh, well, come back to Teen Talk Television, America's number one Teen Talk Television show. And everybody knows that ain't no talk like Teen Talk. That's what I'm talking about. We want to thank Mr. Javier Doan, who was an awesome guest. The next guest that we are going to have, he has done something that nobody in NFL history has ever done. He is in a class all by himself. Nobody has a resume that can match his. He won a high school championship. He won a college championship. He was the Heisman Trophy winner. He won the Super Bowl NFL MVP. He was the Super Bowl MVP. Uh, he was the NFL Offensive Rookie of the Year. He was the NFL uh, 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 player. Uh, uh, he was the most valuable player of the NFL. I mean, in college, he won the Maxwell Award. He won the Walter Camp Award. No player in NFL history has won at every level. He is a natural-born winner. Team Talk Television, would you put your hands together and welcome NFL Hall of Fame and College Hall of Fame, Mr. Marcus 32 Lamar Allen. How you doing, sir? How's Thank you for having me. All right. I thought you were going to miss something, but you did. <laughs> you missed one thing, actually. I was a comeback player of the year. Did you say that? I didn't see that. I'm glad. That yeah. I, and I forgot the Pac-10 player of the year. Okay. All right. <laughs> it took me probably uh, almost a uh, fourth of my lifetime to uh, remember all of that. But I, I, first of all, I just want to say how honored uh, we are to have you on this show. I've had people that have been calling. And like as you met uh, Coach Mike Hill, yeah. I mean, I'm talking about See, we were back there in the 80s and the 90s mm -hmm. when you were destroying the league. And, and what was so awesome is that it's not like you were like big like Earl Campbell or nothing. I mean, it was like you were jumping over people and it's like you were a track star. Y'all got to understand that this man in high school, he was a quarterback. Yeah. And then he goes to college and then he's, first of all, he's a tailback. Then the coach uh, goes to fullback. Well, I was a defensive back first yeah. and then... Because he recruited, um, recruited you as a defensive yes, back. Yes, I was a defensive back. And then um, the coach said, listen, you're too good an athlete to, uh, to sit on the bench. So would you mind playing uh, fullback? And I said, sure. And <laughs> uh, it was tough. It was, it was very difficult. But it was, a, you know, one of the best things that ever happened to me because it made me an all-around player. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I don't think a lot of people realize how all-around you were. <laughs> I was looking at the clips, all these clips we got running, and – you probably threw more touchdowns than any tailback in the league. I don't know if that's a record because every time I – and you were throwing that ball. I don't think I have the most. I mean, I'm <laughs> disappointed that I don't, but uh, I think I have six. And I think um, I have a pretty high passer rating, which is good. But uh, they, I had uh, several that were dropped, so um, – you know, well, I, I get a little upset about that when you <laughs> when you bring that up. Because all the highlights I saw, I never I never saw an incomplete pass, and I was like, maybe they just cut them off. But I want to let you know. It's called when editing. <laughs> <laughs> when you were on the money, you were on the money. Now, now one thing I wanted to do, I wanted to just uh, talk to you about some of the things that you said that I found out that were profound. And then sitting back there, and you know, people like Nelson Mandela. People that I mean, you've been all over the world, all over the world. But you were saying something at one time. You said, uh, "Rich, rich by what you give, and you poor, poor by what you keep." Right. Rich by what you give, and poor by what you keep. And I thought that that was just that was just profound. Can you just uh, put a little meat on the bone for that? Well, whether it's information, whether it's time, whether it's money, I think uh, giving uh, is probably one of the best things you can do. Um, and obviously, you'd be surprised what you get in return. That's not uh, what you're looking for, but it's always chicken soup, I say, for your soul, you know. Um, so I think um, hopefully you know, coming here today and um, uh, providing some sort of information will inspire somebody to, uh, to greater heights. And um, because that's, again, that's uh, – one of my greatest assets is I have lots of information. I've, I've gone through a lot. I've been through a lot. I know how to, uh, to get to the mountaintop. And, and um, it's not easy, but it's, um, if, you, if you're ambitious, if you, if you really want um, people to remember your name, uh, you know, 100 years from now, you know, you got to do something great. You got you to gotta aspire to be great. Uh, you can fall out of bed and be average, you know, and you don't want that. <laughs> Everybody can just do that. I mean, but if you really want to make your mark in life, 
and, and, and everybody should. Um, everybody should make, you know, you're, it's a blessing to be here, first of all, but if you, if you really want to make an impact in your life, you've got to do something great. You've got to do something to, uh, that people will remember and that will benefit people and people will, you know, one of the greatest things that, um, or great feelings I always get is that some kid that I saw, you know, 10 years ago, and he says, you know, Marcus, I just want to thank you. You know, we had this conversation and you gave me some great advice and, oh, by the way, I'm at Stanford now. You know, that's, that's the, you know, that's the greatest feeling in the world, oh, right? Yeah. yeah, so. Well, that's the one thing I was going to ask as we get ready to uh, let them ask. Uh, when you look at your resume, I know people who haven't done a fourth of what <laughs> you've done. And, you know, the arrogance and they, you know, they walk on a cloud. And, you know, like I said, every time I I've, I've saw you, uh, you're always on. I, I know, I said, I know it got to be getting on your nerves. Every time you see him, hey, can I get a picture with you? Can I get a picture with you? I've never, maybe on the inside, but I've never, ever seen you one time look like, Ugh. I mean, you know. <laughs> and uh, I mean, just your level of humility, because like I said, you have something that no, they can say whatever they want to, but when you look at stats and history and your awards, you have something that there is no equal. Yeah. So how do you? Well, because I, I live with gratitude. I mean, honestly, I think about of all the millions of kids, why me? Why, why was I given the opportunity? Um, why was I blessed with great parents? I didn't ask for my parents. Mm -hmm. My parents, I think, will, in June, I think will be their 61st, I think, um, anniversary. Awesome. So, I mean... I mean, I'm not saying this, be, you know, because of my church, but, but the grace of God. Yeah. I mean, really, uh, when I look at everything, I mean, I was blessed with great grandparents. I was blessed with great coaches that always taught me life lessons and stuff. And they knew I was ambitious, and they knew I wanted to go someplace, and they knew um, that I loved what I was, you know, doing as far as sports. And so I always had this that village around me and stuff. I always said, why me? Why was I so lucky to have all these things? And so... Um, when you think about it, you, you, it, it is humbling, mm -hmm. you, you know, it, it, it is something that you got to say, you know, I'm, I'm thankful. And, and mm -hmm. so I walk uh, with gratitude and I, I, um, I always, I never thought that I was different than anybody else other than I just have this, you know, athletic skill, but I'm not different than anybody else and stuff like that. I mean, I do all the things that other people do and stuff like that. I'm no different other than just the sport that I play and stuff and trying to really sort of maximize that. So I got a question. Uh, what's the, what is the difference between, and I'm saying for these athletes that's watching the show, what, what's the difference between being uh, confident and sure yourself as opposed to being cocky and arrogant? The reason I ask that is because uh, I know in your junior year and you went to the coach and uh, he said, let's talk about he said, let's talk about what you want to do next year. And yeah. you said, I want 2,000 yards. He's like, come on, Marcus, let's, let's, let's be for real. I mean, you're like, I am for real. You know, and you got 1,500 yards that year as a junior. Yeah. And, uh, but I mean, you were confident. It's like you knew the gift that you had. And I'm just trying to get them to understand, you don't, you don't have to minimize yourself uh, just because you're confident in your ability. You know what I'm trying to say? Just trying to get the, what's the line between? The, the one person I always grew up admiring was, uh, and the on, only autograph I ever got, guys, was Muhammad Ali for me, right? And I loved how, you know, he, he, how he backed up everything he said. But at, at the same time, I mean, I admired it, but it wasn't me, mm -hmm. right? And my dad always had these words uh, on the wall. He says, be careful the words you use. You may have to eat them one day. So <laughs> I never did a lot of talking, right? And so I let my actions do the talking. And I... Um, I just always felt like I was confident because I know one thing, I put in the work. And I always tell people, they always see us uh, standing up, getting, you know, at, at the podium, accepting awards, but very few people see how, how hard you work, you know. And I was like wearing com combat boots, running up hills, I was pushing cars. When all my friends were hanging out and stuff, I was, I was working. I was working on my skill. I was trying to hone my craft. And um, I always say free lunch costs $1.99. I mean, there's nothing free in this world. <laughs> if, if, if you want it, you got to go get it. 
and you got to work for it. And the W O R K word is something that um, we we hear, but again, I mean, I all that that you're watching right there. I I've been I was since I was a kid. Um, that's what I did. I would go out in the um, we lived near a canyon, and I would go out and run and and you know come up to a tree and make a move and go down there. I would, <laughs> I would, I've been doing that my whole life. So um, it's not, you know, you said it happened, it just happened. But uh, I think uh, I, I put in work for a long, long time. So that's a manifestation of all that work that I put in. And, and that made me very, very confident. But yet I wasn't the one that talked about yeah. confidence. So. Well, I hope you all are hearing that about putting in the work and I grew up with, uh, with JJK. You know, we come from the housing projects down there in East St. Louis. And um, one thing about it, Jackie always said she was going to the Olympics. We'd be like, girl, you ain't going to the Olympics. You're going to be here with everybody else. She always said that she was going to the Olympics. We go to McDonald's. You know, we up there, give me two uh, double cheeseburgers and extra fries and stuff. Jackie would get a fish and a water because she took care of her body. She knew that she was going to the Olympics. And uh, I'm pretty sure you know her first race. I don't know what's wrong with this mic. Her first race, Jackie Joyner Kersey, the world's greatest female athlete, got dead last. Now, she could have gave up. She could have gave up. And we didn't have some of the uh, facilities. Uh, uh, in East St. Louis, we didn't even have asphalt. We had the little stuff that you run that it's like if you were super bright, by the time we got to the end of the race, because it was like dust. Right. And so we running on, on, on these uh, cinder tracks, but you look at where she went, so you have no excuse not to excel because you got to put in the work. And when he said he wanted 2,000 yards that next year, and the coach had doubts, it's like you never had a doubt. You went out there, and give me another mic, because this is, I, I want everybody, you, you, you never had, this, I want to hear what you got, what you're saying. But, uh, but like you said, Edison, but you never, ever, uh, you know, you never, ever had doubts. And that's what I want them to, uh, uh, to understand that, you know, he went. Now, when you, when you were younger, when did you, like, know that you were somebody special? When did you just that day? Can, can I address that yes, yes, person? Sir. Then I'll go back to what you, guys, I made, um, I played tailback. I played I came out as a defensive back, then they moved me to, 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 uh, to, uh, to fullback. And that's not really learning how to play running back. You're just a blocking back, right? And so they moved me to um, tailback that, that uh, my third year there. And I gained 1,500 yards. And I didn't know what I was doing. I just did it just trying to run hard and, and trying to be as physical as possible. And then I, you know, I worked even harder during spring camp. But what I uh, learned was the the intellectual part of the game. See, everybody wants to put, you know, a lot of emphasis on the physicality, guys. But you know, a lot of people um, don't want you to um, emphasize how smart you are. They don't think it's cool and stuff. But being smart is the, is is probably number one, right? And so. I learned everything about the game, everything, right? I was actually a quarterback uh, playing tailback. I knew what everybody was doing on the line of scrimmage. I knew what the defensive players were doing. So just as a result of, uh, of certainly hard work, but because I knew what I was doing, again, I want to emphasize this, because I knew what I was doing, right? I gained 700 more yards, and that was just the mental aspect of that. Now, going back to what you said earlier, Guys, um, Jackie wasn't the only one. And, and I'm a firm believer, guys, that you become what you expect to become. Yes. All right? At 10 years old, guys, I made a decision of what side of the television set I wanted to be on. I said, I want to play and not watch. And I did everything to that end. Guys, you know, Jackie, and talking about the Olympics, guys, at 11, I said I wanted to win the Heisman Trophy. Awesome. I even had a speech. <laughs> no, serious. I mean, it's awesome. not a profound speech, but you look in the mirror and you say, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank my parents. I want to thank my teammates. 
That's what you do at 11. That's what I was doing. So I say to myself that it's not a mistake that I want it. I mean, I put that in motion, and I worked towards it a, a, a long, long, uh, you know, when I was young. So um, there's, there's a saying, guys, that I always say, he or she who knows not where they're going, any road will take them there. All right? Good. The first thing you got to do, in my opinion, is decide what you want to do. All right? And then you got to go after it. You got to get, then you got to gather all the information that can make you an expert in whatever you want to do. And then you got to go out, go after it with all the vigor and all the enthusiasm you possibly can. And because, again, I said a free lunch costs $1.99, meaning there's nothing free. Nobody's going to give you anything. If you want it, you got to make it happen. But if a kid like me who looked at the television set and said, I want to, you know, I want to do all these things, uh, and then, it, then, then for it to happen, it can happen to, to any of you guys. But you got to think the first thing you got to do is put it in the thought, decide what you want, and then go after it. Get all the information, and then go after it. That's what you got to do. Yes, sir. I tell you, that is, that's great. You got some great quotes. I tell you, if you do a book on quotes, I'm definitely going to be telling everybody they need to go out and buy it. <laughs> now, when um, you say Mike, Mike told me that one. Mike. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> now, you say everybody knows how to play, but few people know how to win. Uh, just kind of explain that a little bit. Help them out on that one. Well, there's certain individuals, that, you know, that um, the situation uh, doesn't get too large for them, no matter... Uh, how dire the situation is. There's no panic. They're actually almost comfortable, and uh, it may not look pretty, but winners will find a way. They will, you know, whatever hurdles are put in front of them, they will find a way to 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 excel and 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 come out on top. So, um, so a lot of guys can play football, but only a few people really know how to win. win. You look at Tom Brady; he knows how to win. Um, Mike mentioned uh, Joe Montana. He knew how to win. One of my best friends is Ronnie Lott. Ronnie Lott is a winner in every as aspect of his life, every single aspect of his life. I don't know. I want you guys to look up the name Ronnie Lott. Um, he was my roommate in college, and I couldn't be paired with a better roommate. Um, he was uh, probably the most ambitious um, gentleman I've ever met, and he's probably most one of the most philanthropic. Uh, he started a foundation called All Stars, All Stars Helping Kids. Ronnie's given away, uh, and it's on the West Coast, but he's given away. I'm talking about millions, tens of millions of dollars, um, and he never brags about it or anything like that. But he's just one of those, you know, salt of the earth human beings and stuff. But he just, uh, he, he's a winner. I mean, he, in every aspect of his life, he finds a way to win. He exhausts himself. That's, that's his expression. He's going to exhaust himself. He says, I'm here in a limited time. He says, I'm trying to exhaust my, you know, myself and, and live life to the fullest and help as many people as I can. That's what he says. All right. And, and I, everybody that I knew, like Ronnie, I just know him as a hitter, but I'm glad you mentioned that because I just I remember him knocking people out Complete, into the completely next week. different guy <laughs> off the field. Completely different. <laughs> yes. Now in, in practice, he played USC too, right? Yes. No, he didn't. He didn't hit you in practice because you were roommates. He, he would kill me in practice. Oh gosh. Okay. Yes. <laughs> he actually made me a better player. Uh, the one thing, um, competition and and you know I think uh, do you guys remember uh, Allen Iverson? Oh yeah. Remember Allen Iverson said practice, right? Well. Guys, um, practice is where I became a great player. What I did at practice um, manifested itself in the game. I practiced hard, hard, and it's painful. And every single day, you don't want to, but I always, there was some mechanism of that that I would create and I would talk trash to myself and say, you, you know, you get your butt down the field. Um, don't, you know, you, you don't be, you know, that guy. Uh, champions do this. I mean, whatever, I would talk to myself constantly because for 16 years in the National Football League, it's hard to do the same thing every single day, but I did. And that's what uh, got me to that pinnacle and got me to uh, attain all those those trophies that you mentioned. So, 
That's awesome. Like you said, it's the difference between good and great. And I just, I tell you, I just, uh, uh, we're just really blown away. I'm going to let you guys ask some, uh, ask some questions. I do want to say. Uh, can I say one thing to the yes, kids sir, you real quick? <laughs> hey, good players tell everybody how great they are. Great players, everybody tells them, right? So when you get a, <laughs> do you get it, man? <laughs> good players t uh, tell people how great they are. Great players, everybody tells them how great they are. So don't be that good player and telling everybody how great you are when you're really not that great, so, right? And as great as he is, I just found another talent. This book of quotes, <laughs> quotes by Marcus Allen. I'm telling you, that's going to be a bestseller. You're going to knock Michelle off the top. No. <laughs> so, uh, you all, I know you all got some uh, questions, but I do want to say uh, thank the adults. You know, people would call and say it. Uh, I'm not a teenager, but can I can I come? You know, that's that's my guy. Like the lady out there, she came with her Kansas City uh, jersey on, and uh, um, uh, you know, Mike he modest, but you know, like I said, uh, when Mike was in high school, Michael Hill was probably the greatest gifted, naturally gifted running back in the region. I mean, in probably in the Midwest. But we used to always call him Little Marcus Allen. <laughs> so when I went on Facebook and came, he said, "Hey, uh." Can I come? But of course you can come. That come two days ago. He said, "Man, I can't even sleep. Man, I can't even sleep." So I'm, I'm glad he can sleep now. <laughs> man, why are you want to embarrass him like that, man? Come on. <laughs> we go way. I remember Mike when he when he was a little guy. When he was a little guy. But uh, a lot of adults that came out, they just you know, you're our generation, and I just want to let you know, I don't care who came behind you. There is only one Marcus Allen, and right, I ain't trying I, to I appreciate insult that, nobody. You know, Steven Jackson, Steven's my god brother. He's, I like Steven. Uh, yep, but uh, there's only one you. I always say all the running backs can get in one room, and we can hang out and have a good time. But the wide, wide receivers can't do it because they're like, uh, <laughs> 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 they're always trying to outdo each other, but our egos are intact, man. So. All right, then. So y'all ask some, some questions. I know uh, uh, y'all know about these trophies, and I know – when you go home and you Google guys like him and Eric Dickerson, and Earl Camer, Tony Dorsett, you're going to know that these are the greatest ever. So who's got the first question for him? Okay, Keaton. Uh, with all this uh, success, how did uh, you stay humble and uh, uh, eager to keep going and be consistent? Because I wanted to be great. Um, I just didn't want to play in the National Football League. I wanted to be remembered. I wanted people to remember my name 150 years from now. I said 100 earlier, but I wanted to do something great. Um, to me, I wanted to honor my parents. And honestly, at the, at the end of the day, um, that has been the most uh, important and the driving force by what, because I, I got incredible parents. And I always wanted to thank them for all that they've done. Now. Um, they were supposed to do that because they brought me here. They owed me that. But when you get parents that, that do it with the enthusiasm um, that, they, that they, they do, uh, they did and they do, um, you always want to reward them. So um, I, wanted to be, I wanted to take my parents' places as a result of what I did. Take my parents' places that they, you know, and done things that they have never done. So um, that's one of the reasons. And, and it wasn't about me. Just to, uh, um, just to tell you a little story. Now, the, the, the Hall of Fame format has changed uh, quite a bit now. The speeches were almost approximately 15 minutes, and now they're almost like and so, uh, My dad was the third father ever to introduce their son. Most uh, guys get coaches or writers or somebody like that. And I wanted my dad to introduce me. I wanted everybody to know who my father was because my dad uh, was the oldest of 11 kids, right? He's from Denison, Texas. And what is interesting is, is that he never had a great relationship with his father. And his mom said, hey, go get your dad. Uh, he was down at the bar gambling and tell him it's dinner time. He um, walked down to get him about two miles and walked back, and his dad barely said two words to him. And this is a young kid, he said, if I ever have kids, it'll never be like that. So my father's been amazing, and he still is, right? So I always wanted to, I always remember that, right? But I always wanted to uh, honor my parents and make them happy. 
And so during the Hall of Fame speech, um, the producer came to me and said, Marcus, um, you know, you got to keep your, uh, you may have to cut your speech short because we're running out of time. I didn't even think about it, right? He came back to me a second time. And he says, Marcus, you're going to have to cut your speech short. And I said, listen here, I don't care about me. You better get my father on the air. That's the only thing that mattered, right? Because I wanted to honor my parents. You know, there's another quote in the Bible, honor your parents so your days may be long upon the land, you know? So, um, I, and again, I felt lucky to be born, you know, to great parents and stuff. So being humble was, because it was never really about me too. There's always have to be something bigger than just you. You know what I mean? And so, again, it's like, at, at this game right here, guys, right there, what you don't see is they, uh, they showed my parents in the game. And then my parents were uh, interviewed by Phyllis George, uh, who was one of the uh, first female reporters back then. Um, her and Jane, F uh, was it Jane F Jane Kennedy, excuse me, I'm sorry, Jane Kennedy. And so, um, th you, just to think, I mean, you don't ever think about that stuff, but you're, that, that was a hundred, there was millions of people who saw my parents. And that meant a lot to me, so. Uh, that's why it's easy to stay humble, because it was never really about me. You know, I certainly enjoyed it, and but I enjoyed it because it gave me the opportunity to do so much things for my, for my parents. Awesome, I hope y'all realize that I don't care how old you get, you always, my grandmother raised me and uh, she's been going 13 years and every time I make a decision, I always like, what would my grandmother think? I always, you, you always, if you raised right, you yeah. always want to honor your parents. They be dead and gone, you be thinking they're just gonna come up out the grave and, and snatch you. Well, I see, I got really lucky too, guys, because um, San Diego was only two hours away. Mm -hmm. And so they would come up for all the SC games and then I got drafted by the, the Raiders, mm -hmm. and so I played for them 11 years, and they moved down to uh, L.A. at the same time. So for 15 years, you know, my parents sat basically in the same seats, and before every game, <laughs> I, I saw them, and it was on. Now, wasn't your Hall of Fame induction when in San Diego? Was it in your hometown? No, 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 no. The Hall of Fame induction. Well, and it was I, a I got, um, I was um, notified that I was in the Hall of Fame because. Uh, the Chiefs played the, I'm sorry, the Packers played the Broncos, I think it was. Okay. Uh, that was in 2003. That's when um, I went in. Okay. So it was in the city of San Diego, which was great. So. Awesome. Okay, well, give, I know y'all got to give me another question. Then. Anybody? What's your name? How was, oh, Carter, and I just wanted to know, how was it being a follower of Jesus and in the NFL? And were there people doubting, like, oh, he's a believer of Christ, so he can't be the best? I never, I never had um, an issue with uh, people, you know, uh, knowing I was a Christian. And, I mean, Jesus wasn't timid. <laughs> That's the thing that I was like. Um, and it is, a, it's, it's a tough, it's a physical game. It's, it's, it requires, and, and I think, at the height of competition, you you go after it, mm -hmm. but then there's afterwards there's a respect, and then you know you you you've seen um, a lot of a lot of players uh, kneeling afterwards and, and and giving thanks and stuff, uh, but that that was never a problem. Um, I I think most people when you when you try to do the right thing and um, you play as hard as you possibly can. Um, and you and you do have your faith. I think people respect you. I don't think anybody, you know, is not going to. Yeah, and uh, and and other things that sometimes people think, you know, if if you're a Christian, that you can't be competitive. I mean, when I play sports, I talk more trash than anybody. I know. But after it, you're the best of friends. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's it's one of those things that don't let the Bible. I mean, if you're a Christian, uh, you're gonna let me go through that line. No, I'm gonna knock you out. <laughs> and, and then I'm, I'm gonna help true. you up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So so you know you you uh, you go out to be the best, and you go out to be the best. And like you said, at the yeah. end of the day, people are going to they're going to respect you. They're going to respect you. Just be like uh, Javier. Like I said, um, 
He went to Yale. Uh, he started the first Christian fraternity there. But he still dunked over people. I mean, you know, kind of looked at them sideways after the game. He shook their hands. <laughs> All right. Another question, please. Okay, Paris. My players, they work like seven or eight times. I want you all to know, on the first, uh, first time that he was eligible, first time he was eligible, he, uh, he went there and, and he nailed it. Now, when, you, when, when you're in the Hall of Fame, it's like a fraternity, I guess. So when you all get together, do you all ever talk about who you think was the best? Or is that a conversation that ever? No, only the wide receivers do that. <laughs> <laughs> Only the wide receivers did it. We don't, uh, all the other positions, we just have a good time, and, but they're sort of jockeying, and <laughs> to, it, it's kind of funny. We, you know, we, <laughs> we laugh at them quite a bit and stuff, but um, most of us, we get along, we respect each other and stuff, and uh, it is, um, it, it's a challenge yes. um, for a lot of us younger players to see the older players that have been uh, in the hall for, for many, many years. Uh, the game has clearly changed, guys. Um, when I came in, um, uh, the amount of money I made uh, was gigantic to the guys who came before me. And then, obviously, it's the guys that are playing today. Um, the money is in incredible and stuff. So, But I always had respect for the guys who paid the way for me. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys knew this, I was one of the guys who sued the National Football League for free agency. Mm -hmm. So, and so the guys today are benefiting from, from you know, yeah, exactly. from, from, from um, like one of four guys mm -hmm. that, that did that. So I always felt like um, I, I had I'd, I'd gone through two strikes. Mm -hmm. um, I lost a lot of money and stuff, but I always stood on principle, and I always, I always thought that um, salaries were important, but I always thought benefits were important too. So, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you got to protect people from themselves, so because a lot of guys don't handle things well, and and health is probably at the end of the day the most important thing. So health, health and benefits are always something we, we fought for. Awesome. Well, I got one question. When, when you finally de when you finally decided to retire, was it like a time? Because it's like right now, when I see you, you you're in shape like you go out there tomorrow and uh, <laughs> jump over somebody. So, well, I mean. We always <laughs> look like we can play, but we, we, we can't play anymore. I mean, and I played more games, I think, than any running back in history of the game. I think. I'm not certain, but it, or really close to it. And um, they wanted me to play one more year, but. There, there's, um, there is the um, emotional level that, that you sort of have to deal with. It's like I've been doing this since I was 10 years old, mm -hmm. right? And then there's the, uh, uh, the monetary level that you have to think about. Like, boy, I'm making a lot of money, man. Mm -hmm. You don't ever want it to stop. But then there's the intellectual level that says, hey, I can't play forever. Mm -hmm. So you got to be, you know, you got to eventually be smart and your health is important. And I, uh, guys, I, you don't know how lucky I am or how blessed I am. I played 16 years and um, only I, I broke my wrist and my right arm doesn't straighten out all the way. Uh, when I tell people I never had knee surgery, they, just, they can't believe it. No, the right. way you jumped over people. Yeah, <laughs> oh I God, mean, so, awesome. and I didn't, play, uh, I didn't play timidly either. I played, I never, I never thought about injury. I never thought about injury, never thought about anything negative. Uh, sometimes when, when life was, you know, difficult, um, the, the safest place for me, the, the, the most comfortable place was the field. So mm -hmm. a lot of times, um, but I went out there and, and gave it everything I, um, everything I had, but I never thought about injury, and neither should you guys ever. Awesome. Well, you got a couple more questions for, yes, sir. When you uh, finally got away from the uh, situation with the Raiders where they didn't want to play you and you got to the Chiefs, like what was your plan when you got there? Well, I wanted to go to a place. Um, actually, Marty Schottenheimer had called me uh, several times. Um, I looked at the, uh, the Redskins and the Miami Dolphins. Um, I was interested in because of Dan Marino. I always wanted to go to a place with a good quarterback. And um, the Redskins had a good, you know, they, a, a great offensive line, and they could they, they were running the ball well, and I thought I could fit really well there. 
And then you always want to think about places um, that you can benefit from, benefit from too. Washington, D.C. would have been a nice place and stuff. But um, he called me. I never returned his call. But then they heard they got Joe Montana, right? Then I said, hmm. And they had AstroTurf, right? There was a couple of things that happened. They had AstroTurf, and they said they were going to grass. Then they had Joe Montana, too, right? And Marty was calling me every day, right? Which means that he really wanted me. So I went back and, and, and talked, and um, I just I, ju I, I loved it. And it was, it's one of the, the, the greatest places to play, greatest fan bases, uh, a great family to play for. The Hunt family is tremendous, just cr incredible people. Um, the late Lamar Hunt guys it was one of the richest people around, and he would fly coach. I mean, you would never know he had money and stuff. He was just one of the more humble um, people. I remember him coming down um, the elevator, uh, walking into the locker room, and one of the guys with the yellow jacket didn't know who he was, and he said, "Come in," and he didn't. He didn't uh, say, "Are you crazy?" I own this team. What are you talking about? I can't come in. He just walked around to the other door. He was just that kind of guy and stuff. So it was great to play for them. And my one regret is that we didn't uh, bring them a Super Bowl. We got close, but close is no cigar. You recording that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It was Buffalo. We... Um, we were actually playing really well, and Buffalo at that time was one of the toughest places in the world to uh, uh, to win at. And uh, we were doing extremely well until Joe he got knocked out. Um, he got hit, and it was very cold. And it's on, I think it's AstroTurf. And, and um, on AstroTurf, the ground is even harder. Yeah. It's, a, it's like cement, so his, his head hit the back of the... Uh, uh, the turf and like a boxer hits the canvas, you know, he, he, he was out. And then we just we went downhill from there. So, oh my goodness, well, anybody else got a uh, okay? Get past, um, like playing behind somebody. Like, how did you get past that obstacle? It wasn't easy, it wasn't easy because, um, the owner and I didn't get along. And, um, let me say now that. His son and I are, you know, really cl close friends, and um, it it challenges you as a person. And I was talking, I think, Mike about this earlier. Um, that I was always a good teammate. I won this award. It's called the Commitment of Excellence Award because I was a great teammate, voted on by my teammates, and I won the award uh, <coughs> one year when I didn't even play. Because even though I didn't play, I was encouraging everybody else to play well. And I said this before, it was easy for me to just like, you know, to, um, you know, go isolate myself and be quiet and stuff like that. But I never did. Um, and especially when they bring somebody in to take your place, I never wanted to be that teammate that would not give him all the information that was necessary for him to play well. Because if we lost and he didn't have certain information. I would have felt bad about that. So it was just, it's, it's, it challenges you as a person. I always think about just, just doing the right thing. Um, what would you want somebody to do to you if you were in that position? You would uh, certainly, you know, you know, a lot of guys don't know the plays and stuff, but you have to tell them the plays and make sure they look out for this and look out for that. And, and regardless of who they brought in, um, I guess the uh, the real testament is that we're all friends. We're all friends. Um, uh, Bo Jackson, uh, Eric Dickerson, Roger Craig, we're all friends. So, and they'll tell you, I, I never uh, held back any any information or tried to help them out at all. So, or try not to help them out, rather. All right, TJ. What would you be doing if you weren't in the NFL? You know, I don't, I don't, I, don't, I never thought about that. That was my, uh, I mean, we should all have a backup plan. Um, but I, for some reason, I mean, I, I, I knew it was going to happen. 
Do you guys understand uh, when you want something so badly, you start to see your dream and you take shape and form? Mm -hmm. And I started to flex muscles in my dream and it started to become reality. I mean, everything that I thought of actually happened. And what happens at a, uh, at a Pop Warner level, um, it started when I was playing defensive back, right? I was really good, actually. You know, they would run the ball my way, they would all get stuffed, and then I would get no more action, right? <laughs> so I knew I was actually. And then my next, the only other time I played running back, I actually scored 30 touchdowns. Um, I had 11. Never played running back after that again, but I, was, I knew I was pretty good then. And this is a, a story, guys. When I was 13 years old, now, I don't know how you guys feel about where you guys live, um, but sometimes you think you're, you know, sort of junior varsity compared to another area. Well, I grew up in San Diego, and we thought we were like junior varsity compared to Los Angeles, right? L.A. was like big time, right? And to Compton, right? <laughs> and so the Compton Comets came down to play us in San Diego, and we beat them down there. Now, the uh, oldest age was supposed to be 13. Uh, some of the guys looked like they were 15 and 16, <laughs> right? But we beat them down there. Now we're going to go to Los Angeles and play them, right? And I know they have gang members and everybody in the stands and stuff like that. You can see their colors were red, black, and green, black power <laughs> colors, right? And um, I went up there and ignored all the other things in the stands, and I played at 13, right? I played a game that was just incredible. I was all over the place. And that was like, man, I can play. I can play in Los Angeles. I'm good enough to, I mean, you figure you can play in LA, you can play anywhere. This is 13 years old. So, I mean, as you continue to, gr uh, you know, to, to at each level, there's, a, there, there's something that happens that says, that gives you confidence, right? So that was like a big boost then. And then I go to high school and I'm playing, um, you know, starting as a freshman and I'm killing it as a freshman, right? And so um, my, 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 uh, my senior year, you know, I'm getting accolades and stuff like that, but my senior year, what happened was that um, my coach, I was playing safety and I, I like to hit everybody, hit everything that moved, guys. <laughs> and my coach asked me to play quarterback. And uh, I didn't want to. But I did as instructed. I went on the offensive side of the ball and I fumbled the ball eight times in a row on purpose, right? <laughs> he kicked me off the team. Now, I'm the best player in San Diego, right? So as I'm walking home, I'm saying my dad is going to be so upset, right? And he did me one of the best favors, though. My, my dad didn't rescue me. My dad said, well, that's between you two. He didn't go to school and sit down and talk to him. He didn't, didn't, didn't do any of that. He said, that's between you two. So I had to go back and apologize. And as it turned out, it, it, this is how, I, do you call this fate, Mike? And this is how things work out. No, no, seriously. <laughs> Th this, is, this, this, is how, this is fate. I'm telling you guys right now, I feel like this was sort of, or, you know, it was, this was Distance. ordained. It yeah. was like, now, <laughs> SC sees me playing, the SC sees me playing uh, quarterback, and they see me running the ball. If I'd never played quarterback, right, they would have never known that I could run the ball. So when I got the SC, when everybody got hurt, they would have never asked me to play uh, running back. So that's how things, and it seemed, everything seemed to fall in place for me. So I always feel like this was God's plan, you know, and I just got out of the way and did what I was told to do. So, I mean, even going to, I mean, how lucky can you get, guys? I'm in, I'm in USC, and the first year that, the, that I get drafted, the Raiders moved to Los Angeles. I don't even have to move. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right there. So I played in L.A. for 15 years straight. I got more yards than anybody at the Coliseum, period, dude. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I mean, things like that, they happen. And so you got to, you know, you, that's why you said, man, you look back and you go like, man, I'm blessed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so you can't be cocky when you're like, you know, you're blessed like that. Because, you know, it's like that wasn't by my doing. Yeah. I, was, I was like, you know, I just had great things happen to me and great coaches and things like that. So.
All right. And, and one thing about it, uh, you, you all didn't just play. I was looking at the one Super Bowl where y'all just destroyed. It was 34 to, I mean, just, it was like a, you were playing like junior varsity. I mean, <laughs> it seemed like the confidence just boiled over into the other players. Cause it, John, John Pacinda said uh, nothing on earth could have run, block, and tackle could have stopped the Raiders on Black Sunday. That's right. <laughs> and they said it seemed like as soon as the sun went down, the Raiders started playing better, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, they beat us early in the year, but we had several starters, including myself, that didn't play. Okay. So they, they and they were on a roll, and they, you know, we, we were confident. We were very confident that um, we were going to win. It was just going to a matter of uh, how badly. That's so, well, that's awesome. Uh, I just tell you, uh, you have really uh, your mark on the game. Like I said, uh, I was telling everybody. I said they was calling out other backs. I said, but did they win at every level? You know, I said, but did they win at every level? And like I said, I hope that these. Uh, Athletes, because most of them play sports. I hope you uh, look at the uh, at the humility. I mean, even now we see, haven't touched it, on all the walls. See, it's funny. You make me think about things. <laughs> no, you really do, guys. I was the first player, and, and this is what I always go. I was the first player in college for two thousand yards. It was. They have several that have done it since then, but I was the first. Yep. I was the first player that gained ten thousand yards rushing and five thousand receiving. So all those things, like you know. They they do matter when yeah. you when you when you you look back and you reflect and and, and, and your place in the game and um, I have a son that's five and um, it's interesting you know um, that you know he uh, he didn't come along while I was playing so he knows really knows nothing uh, about what I've done other than he sees some of these trophies. Yeah. And it's it's nice to you know sort of leave a, leave, uh, leave a legacy for your for your son hopefully and he may not play football he may not play any sport at all but uh, a legacy of excellence that he can aspire obviously that's I think the the, the greatest thing. Awesome, he definitely grows up. Hey dad, why is that man doing like that? <laughs> so that was the trophy. Another thing, uh, what is three of y'all had the most two hundred yard rushing games in the I think in the NFL is. These three you all this tied the most 200 yard games. No, I think I had I don't know was it 11 straight? I think so. Something yes. like that. I don't know. It's some, some crazy number. That's when you know you got yeah. so many awards that you can forget yeah. some. <laughs> well, I don't, yeah, I don't remember all of them, and 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 not really. Um, I really don't think about it. You know, I really don't. I um, I'm really satisfied with what I did. Um, people say about today, I said, no, I mean, th this was my time, you know what I mean? It's like we can't project ourselves in, um, into today. We can't project, us, you know, how much money we would have made. It don't matter. Uh, I, I came along when I did. I, I maximized um, um, my opportunities and, and try to make the best of it. So. Okay. Well, I got one last question where I say the clock on the wall says it after all. With all of your, of your knowledge of the game, now, one thing, uh, 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 there's a coach in this area, I don't know if you heard about uh, Coach Bob Shannon. He was a legendary coach and just won championship after championship. Matter of fact, Mike played one year and he, he transferred and had he stayed over there, then Mike would have had that championship trophy. I told him, I said, Mike, stay at East St. Louis, and he went over to the other school, but uh, he did his thing over there. But he used to always say, you're, you're smart as athlete. He would take the quarterback, and he said, the quarterback is usually the best athlete on the team especially those that, like you say, get the intellectual part. So with all of the knowledge and the intellect that you learned of the game, have you ever been tempted or teased to, to coach and to plant that into younger uh, players? Not, not professionally. I'm, I'm not a, um, I, I like time management, and I don't really think living, uh, is going to work at six in the morning and stay until two at night, <laughs> especially when the. <laughs> I always say, why are those guys staying up there? All you know, all those late hours, and we're playing, yeah. and we're going <laughs> home at five, you know, and it just doesn't make any sense. And um, but I always like to give information. I've always said that uh, I'm willing. Mm -hmm. I don't try to project myself on you know into situations and stuff. But if somebody wants some information, I'd be gladly to to give it. So, okay. Because I was wondering, I think Magic was saying that when he was coaching, 
these athletes today, you know, on the cell phones and, you know, they just, you know, just kind of don't take the game serious. And I was just wondering, was that maybe one of the reluctances to just kind of some I'm, of the modern day I'm, I'm glad I didn't come along in this era and stuff. Um, it, it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, I always thought that if you play well, you're going to get followers. Mm -hmm. It seems like people are doing things just to get attention and yeah. to get followers. I don't want anybody to follow me other than, you know, if I play well, people are going to follow me, yeah. right? That's the ultimate thing. If you just do what you're supposed to do, you'll get as many followers uh, as you as you ever want. But we don't have to do anything like, you know, some antics to get that, you know what I mean? We don't have to, um, you know, even, yeah. the pr even the Pro Bowl today, I mean, you got players like begging for votes. I mean, dude, dude, <laughs> I, I would never beg for votes. I was like, if you play well, like, you know, <laughs> it's gonna you. hey, please vote for me. I'm like, really? <laughs> It's like, I mean, it's like it's a popularity contest and not, you know, the the the, the, the most, um, the highest regard you can get is from your fellow player. Yeah. You know, you always have people that, uh, you know, pundits and um, uh, maybe coaches that, um, coaches vote's important, but when you get the respect from your fellow players, that's the most important thing because they know who could play. Yeah, <laughs> they know who's like a sort of a manufactured, uh, you mm -hmm. know, press made athlete. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or, or guys know who can actually play, and they get the respect from each other. So, all right, but well we we truly uh, appreciate, and I want to say to you all, uh, you might not really know the day we go home, but it's not often. I wish when I was coming up your age that I could say I said. <laughs> next to a Heisman Trophy winner that's got a, a resume like that. So I just want to let you all know, when you go home and Google, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, that's who that was. But I'm telling you, you are really, really fortunate. You're really fortunate. Like I said, nobody in NFL history, so he doesn't, there's nobody you're going to find an equal. And I doubt if there'll ever be anybody that win at every level. They ain't done it yet, and uh, I don't see it happening anytime soon. So I just really appreciate uh, you taking your time out. I mean, you be a ESPN, CBS analyst. I mean, you are on major international networks. You go all over the world, and I mean, come here and sit down with you know uh, local kids. Um, you don't you don't find a lot of people like well, you, you ain't got a million followers, or you know they just ain't coming. But I, I just really appreciate uh, your humility. I really appreciate and every time I see you. I mean, you're the you're just the ultimate class. You're the class that well, you're not. You. So uh, well, anybody you, got one last thing? You, you're fine. Does remarks. the parents have anything to ask out there? No? We truly appreciate it. I'm not a member of this church, but I've known Willie since undergrad days. You're and, welcome. And um, again, thank you so much. And right there? Okay. Um, I just wanted to know, how did it feel to play against, to me, or with, I should say, one of the best linebackers, Derek Thomas? Oh, uh, Derek was a treat. Uh, it's sort of sad. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Derek Thomas is. He uh, was a, one of the greatest linebackers in the history of football, and he uh, died in a car accident. Um, I think it was an, on an icy day. So, uh, but he was also he had a um, uh, he had a foundation called Third and Long. That's what it was, and he did so much for his community, and he was well loved by everybody. And it was he was great. I mean, you just knew uh, when you needed a play. He was going to deliver, but there was so much more to him than just that. Uh, again, I think what he did for the Kansas City community, he was probably as as uh, loved as uh, anybody that has ever been a part of that organization. Um, the people in Kansas City truly uh, treasured him. They could have used him last week. I'm sure <laughs> wanted his spirit to just feel that field last week. I'm like, yeah, on. I know. <laughs> that, uh, lining up both sides was. Uh, that was that was a tough one. So, and if it that, that doesn't happen, they get the interception and they probably win the game. So, All right. so my question is, um, there are a lot of students there that are probably on different levels. Some are scholar athletes. Some may be struggling in their classes. If there was one thing that you could give them as a takeaway today, what would it be? Despite your circumstances, despite where you come from, um, you can become anything you want to. There are so many stories, guys, out there. Unfortunately, we always 
sort of limit her to a few stories here and there, but like Paul Robeson, everybody, you guys know who Paul Robeson is? I mean, he locked himself in a closet and to learn how to, you know, I think it was, was it the, the time he was going? I mean, just people do some amazing things um, with far less, you know, um, circumstance than, than what we have right here. And so I think that uh, you should let nothing ever get in your way. Don't let anybody, don't believe when somebody says you won't amount to anything. Don't believe them, all right? Actually challenge them and say, you know what, I'm going to be great despite your negativity. Uh, despite my surroundings, I can reach incredible heights. But listen here, guys. Education is the most important thing because if you're smart, um, if one road is closed, smart people can find another. And they can find another. But if you don't get an education, uh, you're relegated to poverty. You really are. And I know all you guys aspire for more than that. So um, I know, you know, nobody ever wants to talk about education. People don't want you to be smart. But it is so cool to be smart. It is cool to be smart. And you'd be surprised some people that have uh, done well in school and either gotten opportunities to go to college and have done um, some amazing things. I, I, I met Condoleezza Rice. I mean, what an amazing story. I mean, she comes from Alabama, guys, where at that particular time, I mean, you're talking about headwinds. I mean, opposition. And yet, I mean, if you were to look at her life, you guys know what I'm talking about? Former Secretary of State. Condoleezza. Come from a very, you know, socially, economically depressed community in Alabama and made it all the way to the White House. Um, the only thing to hold you back, I think, most often is yourself. So, but you always have, see, I, there's a couple of things that I, w that I was, I benefited greatly from. One, um, and my mother was, I mean, that, that natural for mothers to do that because they're sort of nurturing, but my dad always told me he loved me, all right? Always told me he loved me. Um, and he loved my mother, so I, I always saw that, that love there, right? And then um, he, he showed no partiality. He treated all his kids the same. But lastly, my father went to work every day. And so that's where I got my work of it from, right? And I used to go to work with him because my father, uh, he built his own house. And my father would take us to work on the hottest days in San Diego. He, and, and, and he wouldn't take us any other time. He took us on the hottest days. And, and he said, guys, do you guys want to do this or go to college? And all of us said, we want to go to college. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's <laughs> oh, some reverse psychology. Yeah, so <laughs> he didn't pick a day that was cool or anything like that. He would pick us the hottest days of the summer, and we'd be on the roof nailing, you know, uh, two by fours and <laughs> plywood. And he would, he would look at us and say, you guys want to do this for a living, or do you want to go to college? <laughs> go to college. And guys, I was the big man on campus. I was the best player in San Diego. Best player in San Diego. I had to be home by 12. That's right. Curfew. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> nothing, you know, and, and I had to do, if I didn't do well in school, no sports. So, but I always wanted to be, I w the, the people that I admired the most were always uh, very smart people mm -hmm. and, and very courageous people. Those were the, really the two traits that I always admired. And Muhammad Ali, may not have been book learned, but he was smart, guys. He yeah. was so smart. Um, and he was courageous. So that's the one person I told you I, I admired the most. And that's the one autograph that I had gotten for me was him. All right. Well, we truly, truly thank you. Uh, I think the adults thank you probably more than the kids because we, we were around. And uh, 
I don't know what because I, I had news people that were calling me. I don't know what happened. They supposed to, so it's, uh, and people are like, you mean the Marcus Allen gonna be the? I say I don't know another one. I say the one played for Pittsburgh. I say it's not the same one. No, no pun intended. Uh, uh, Sean. <laughs> but I, I want to say thank you to all of the technical people. That's my my brother back there. He's our audio visual guy at the church, and and he's the ultimate. Still a fan, so he put together all of these clips and put in all the work. And he had one clip where you beat the Steelers. He said, no, "I'm taking that out. I'm not. I'm not showing him beating my Steelers." <laughs> so I said, "You're not gonna wear your Steelers stuff to the show." He said, "I sure am." And then, then he, he wore the shirt and everything. But uh, thank you so much, Sean. I know this was a lot of work at the last minute for you to go out and pull them and 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 put it in. But want to say thank you to Sean and thank you to uh, Penny. Give the give the media people a hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Sean, if this makes you feel any better, playing the Steelers was always one of the more physical games uh, of the year. And it was I, I call it a nice tub game. Uh, I would always sit in the ice tub after we played the Steelers. So. <laughs> <laughs> the steel curtain. Well, we're getting ready to go off the air. Uh, if you were playing now and you were in that game when they missed that call and you – what would have been your response, the professional and the one under your breath? I don't know. Uh, I, I, may have little, I'm, I may have lost it. I mean, it's amazing how many guys show composure. When you work that hard mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it's, most people forget. I mean, it's a long season, right? You got training camp. You got uh, OTAs. I mean, during the off season. Uh, you're working hard, uh, and there's blood, sweat, and there's tears, and then it comes down to somebody else not making a call that was, you know, obvious to uh, aliens on Mars. <laughs> it is. Uh <laughs> well, you know, we know how it feels in St. Louis. Uh, matter of fact, it was Kansas City that got us, remember, in baseball, and they missed that call and cost us a World Series. So I know uh, uh, even now, you know, that was 85. It's 2019. Right. And you talk about that game. That's like a, it's like a cuss word, you know. <laughs> you need therapy. You got to get over there. You I didn't say me. I was just saying most of these St. Louis. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I say that to the, I say that to the, uh, the Redskin fans, too. They, they bring that up, the, you know, the, 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 the game they lost. Dude, you got to get over that, man. You need some therapy. That was years ago. Let that stuff go, man. <laughs> Well, thank you so much uh, for coming, and uh, you really have uh, helped all of us. You have great wisdom, and I tease, but your quotes are off, they are off the chain. And that is really <laughs> something that you really uh, ought, ought to consider, because, I mean, uh, you need those, that wisdom and those, those good quotes that really challenge your mind and make you think. And I, I really I, I love a great thinker, and I love somebody who's uh, intellectually astute and uh, doesn't mind sharing that. So once again, uh, Teen Talk Television, America's number one Teen Talk Television show. This is the ultimate show. It's only once in a lifetime that you get somebody that can be compared to nobody on earth. Now, we were talking about higher, that would be different. But on earth, there is nobody that's <laughs> equal to this man. He's one at every level. He's still humble. He's still willing to share. He's still willing to give back to the community. So one last time as we go off the air, give a hand to this man who is second to none, Marcus Lamar Allen, number 32 for the Oakland Raiders. And he is retired, number 33, for the University of Southern California Trojans. Let's put the music up. Let's get ready to go. <laughs> so much. We'll go off the air. And I know some folks want to come and uh, take your picture. Right now. All right, I'll stand up. Oh. Oh. Well, the kingdom suffering violence. But the violent take it. Take it by force. Here we go now. Ain't no talk like uh. Ain't no talk like Ain't no top light. Ain't no top light. Come on now. Ain't no top light. Ain't no top light. Ain't no top light. Somebody scream. From the east side to the west side. That's why Team Top Television, America's number one Team Top Television show. And everybody knows that ain't no top like Team Top. We will see you next week on the show. But thank you for the greatest show all ever. To one of the greatest players ever in the history of the NFL. Marcus Lamar Allen, 32. See you next week. We're out. Peace.